Today I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts and we're going to be looking as our foundational text, Acts chapter 14. So I'll give you a few moments to turn to Acts chapter 14 and our foundation is going to consist of verse 1 through 22. 1 through 22. While you're finding that, I'll lead us in a time of prayer. God, it's your word here. And Jesus, we know where two or three are gathered together in your name that you are there. This message that's being proclaimed is not because of the popularity of it, but it's being proclaimed because it is medicine for the soul. We pray, God, for those that are here that need to draw closer to you, that your spirit will do that. We pray, God, for hearts that have grown cold, that, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will set their soul on fire, that they will, Lord, take you as who you are, and that they will be serious into the day that you call them home of their salvation. We pray, God, also for anyone that might be in this particular room that has never made a profession of faith, that, Lord, by the time that we leave this place, they'll be encouraged by your Spirit to do so. This is your word. We are your people. We pray, God, that we will continue to be Bible-based, Christ-centered, and as always, ministry-focused. In Jesus' name, amen. When you come to the book of Acts, you find that what God is doing is God's moving because people are willing to be moved. It's kind of hard to get uh, an animal to do something. You hear about someone saying that someone is stubborn as a mule. Well, I believe that sometimes we could change that statement and say that some people are stubborn as Christians because we can be very stubborn about what we do if it's not in our own interest or if it's not in our own time frame. But what we find in the book of Acts, and especially in chapter 14, and it amazes me, and I've re-read and reread this chapter multiple times because it has given me such a blessing, and I pray that whenever we finish reading this text that you will say we are blessed by what God did with these men and how they were willing to be moved and not to be stubborn. And because of their obedience, what happens is that you're going to discover that God Almighty is going to pour out a revival upon the people who needed it. And who are the people that needed it? Everyone. Everyone that would simply receive the Word. And so we look today at the text and it says that the same thing happened. And what the same thing that's talking about in that text is persecution, preaching of the gospel, whenever God's word grows, persecution grows. And it says that the same thing happened at Iconium, and they entered into the Jewish synagogue. Now to have a Jewish synagogue, you had to have at least 10 Jewish men in the community to have a synagogue to be established. And so it says that as they entered, and who are they? It's the Paul and Barnabas. It says as they entered a Jewish synagogue, and they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. I want to stop there for a moment. Is your speech about Jesus so convincing, so passionate, so loving, so gracious that when people hear that you talk about your passion for the Lord, they say, I want some of what they have. You see, it's not enough that your cup is filled. We need to pray, God, fill me up so much that I am pouring over. You see, overflowing in what God has done. I'll tell you, some of you that are sitting here today know for a fact that where God has blessed you, that you've got so many blessings in your life, it is overflowing, and people around you should see that. And so it says here that people that heard this, Jews and Greeks, believed, meaning that there was no distinction between the people that needed to hear the gospel. It wasn't that, no, the gospel is just for this one class of people. No, the gospel, my friends, is for every single person. Person. And it says these people believed, and in verse 2, it's the great word that has snuck in there. Good things are happening. People are believing. People are getting baptized. The Holy Ghost is moving. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against the brothers. So what happens is that the Word of God is moving and active and the Word of God is powerful and what is taking place is that Satan knows that with one 
person saved, that's one less person that will be with him for eternity. I heard this person speak recently and on their message it says that God hates when you laugh. I went, or not God, but Satan and the person, there was such a false prophet. Maybe that's why I've got this a little mixed up. Let me get it right. The person said, Satan hates when you laugh. Let me tell you something. The only thing Satan hates is when you become saved. This person was going on in their sermon and stated, it said that they know for a fact that the reason why comedians, and they use Robin Williams was as an example, they said the reason why comedians are such under attack by, by Satan is because Satan doesn't want people to laugh and have a good time. Well, I, I just want to just put just a thought in that. My friends, Satan could care less if you laugh your way all the way to hell. He doesn't care that you're happy here. In fact, Satan wants you happy. Satan wants you tickled. Satan wants you distracted. What Satan doesn't want is you saved. You see, you see, here what we see is that Satan has put in the hearts of these people who oppose the gospel to cause problems. Today, when you leave here, you're going to simply leave here with the Spirit of God or the Spirit of a Antichrist. You cannot leave here without something filling your spirit. And it says that these People who wanted to poison the minds of the Gentiles began to stir problems. And in the next verse it says, So they stayed there sometime and they spoke boldly in reliance of the Lord. Notice that Paul and Barnabas, when they found that these troublemakers were there, Paul and Barnabas didn't say, Well, you know, we, we don't want to cause problems. Well, we're, we're, we're ruffling the feathers. Oh, we made a ripple. We made them mad with what we preached. Maybe we need to put on more smiles. Maybe we need to continue to tickle their ears. No. Paul and Barnabas says, if you didn't like the last sermon, just wait to the next sermon we preach. You see, what is taking place here is the boldness that God's power is greater than Satan's power. And if you live that way, you will be bold enough to stand up and say, regardless of what the world says is right and normal and kosher, I will follow God. And then it says this, it says that so they stayed there. Boy, that's a powerful statement there. Through problems, they still stayed. They stayed there for some time and they spoke boldly in reliance on the Lord. They didn't rely on the Southern Baptist Convention. They didn't rely on their knowledge. They didn't rely on their good looks. They relied on the Lord. How many of you know that farmers, every time they put a seed in the ground, they rely on the Lord? Amen? Amen. And it says that who testified, and here if you mark your Bibles, here's one of those mark your Bible verses. It says, who testified the message of His grace. Now the reason why I've got that underlined in my Bible is because what was the message they preached? The message they preached was not something that you would expect modern day preachers preaching. They preached grace. And the reason why they preach grace is because grace is what we need to hear. God's riches, God's salvation He offers at the expense of the death of His own Son, Jesus Christ. He gave us not what we deserve. That is grace. That is mercy. And it says that He preached, that Paul and Barnabas preached the message of grace by granting that signs and wonders be performed. The greatest sign and wonder right now that can be performed is when a lost person finds Jesus. Now yes friends, I tell you, I, I'm ready just like you to see the blind see and, and the lame walk. And we'll see that when we get to heaven. Some of us might even see that here. I hear stories and testimonies from very reliable missionaries around the world in some of the deepest parts that you would never want to travel to. Some missionaries that I've even worked with in Africa, while I was there, they said they saw this happening and they would give a testimony of that. But they would always go around to this point before they ended their statement that they saw this so God would be praised. Not that the person got praised or the person that did the praying got praised, but God got praised. And so signs and wonders, what did they do? They point people to Jesus. And then the next verse says, But the people of the city were divided. And that's one of those statements when I read it, I'm like, well, duh. 
The Word of God is sharp like a sword and it will divide. It will divide light and darkness. It will divide truth and error. It will divide families. It will turn a husband against a wife. It will turn a wife against a child. It will turn a child against a sibling. Because you see, the thing is, is that if you firmly believe in the Word of God, if you are there with someone who does not, it is going to cause problems. You know what we do a lot of times in families is that we just rather not like politics at Thanksgiving and religion at Thanksgiving. Let's just don't talk about it. Well, you know, it's okay not to talk about politics at Thanksgiving, but it's always a good time to talk about Jesus. And understand that when you do, a division can happen. They're either going to be amening or, well, we got to go. Well, my friends, don't stand before God and give an account that you did not at least share the good news. And it says here, it says division was happening in the city. Uh, Do you not think today that division is happening in America? And it's not political division. You know, people try to say, well, it's a political divide. No, it's not. Because you got corruption on both sides. What the divide is, is that people that believe in the goodness and grace of Jesus Christ and those who believe in the goodness of themselves. That's really what the divide is. I'm too good to be wrong. I'm too good to be what you call a sinner. My Bible tells me that we've all sinned. And then it says, but the people were divided into city and some... Uh, It were siding with the Jews and some with the apostles. In verse 5 it says, And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to assault and stone them, uh, you know, I find this amazing that the Jews and Gentiles who would have been at each other's throat and hated each other any other time, it's amazing that these two people groups come together to destroy God's messengers. You might be wondering to yourself, well, I thought they were enemies. Well, they are enemies, but they had a greater enemy, and the greater enemy was the Word of God. And it says that when they attempted to do this, they wanted to stone them. The Jews and the Gentiles wanted to really just murder, execute Paul and Barnabas. And it says in verse uh, 6, they found out about it, and they fled to Laconian cities or towns called Lystra and Derbe. So whenever Paul and Barnabas find out that they're on the hit list, they say to each other, well, if we get killed, what's going to happen? We've got a mission. They don't want to accept the mission. We've preached the gospel. It's divided the people. It's time to do what? Dust off our shoes and go to the next village. And so what happens, it says that they went and to the surrounding countryside... And verse 7, and yet they kept on preaching. They kept on evangelizing. Even though they were on the run, even though that where they were at it caused division, even though that they had their names on a hitman's list, they didn't stop being who Christ called them to be. Some of you are going to get that. Here's why I'm saying about it. Is that even though you go through hardship, even though you go through pain, even though you might go through the things that you're going through, understand this, it should not stop you from being the child of God that you have been called to be. You see, because when we've been called to evangelize, and every one of us have, male, female, boy, girl, uh, young, old, black, white, we've all been called that are saved to evangelize, that once we've been called to do that, nothing should put out our fire. And in verse 8 it says, In Lystra, a man without strength in his feet, lame from birth, and who had never walked, was sitting there. Now stop there. You've got a man that now, Paul and Barnabas, they've been run out of town. They kept on preaching. And they get to Lystra. And in Lystra, when they get there, and what I think is amazing by that name of the town, that what they're at, do you remember there was a young preacher later on will become uh, what Paul calls his son in the ministry by the name of Timothy. This is where Timothy's hometown is. So possibly what I'm about to read to you, Timothy, his mother and grandmother witnessed what took place, what I'm about to read to you. More than likely he did see what's happening. 
But they get there and they discover a man, it says, that from his very birth cannot walk. Can I tell you this? That from our very birth, we are born into sin. We are not walking with the Lord when we're born. I don't care how beautiful that baby is. I don't care how much they can goo-goo and gaga and melt your heart. That baby is born into sin and they need salvation just like you and I. Now, yes, I do know that there's such a thing as called the age of accountability. And when they get to that age of accountability, once they have a reasoning in their mind, and some people will never get to the age of accountability. Those people that have a mental defect, those people that have something that's just not right, God has mercy on them. I will tell you that, my friends, and that we need to thank God for His grace and mercy. But whenever a person is born, they are born into sin. And just like this man, they need a touch from God. And so here it says this man from birth is there. He cannot walk. If he cannot walk, what does that mean? He cannot work. Means he has to rely on someone to get him to the place, to the Son of God, so he can beg for money. We've seen very examples of this throughout the Scripture already, have we not? So this is nothing new that someone is lame and asking or begging for something. But here it says that this man who who is lame from birth, who cannot walk, who is paralyzed in his feet and his legs, it says in verse 9, And he heard Paul speaking. He wouldn't just hear Paul asking Barnabas, well, where are we going for lunch today? That's not what, when Luke writes this and says he heard Paul speaking, he's not talking about, they're talking about what happened in the previous town. What he is actually alluding to, he's saying this, what was Paul doing in the city before? He was preaching. He preached the Word of God. What what was the message he preached? Grace. When he left that city in fear of being murdered, it says he left there preaching evangelism. So do you think by any chance that what this man heard when he says he heard Paul speaking, what he heard was Paul preaching because he would have been at the local synagogue. This man who could not walk, who could not do for himself, yet he still is able to hear. God is still merciful enough to allow him to be able to hear the word spoken. And it says here, it says, my friends, and this is one of those messages, the scripture that really just touches me more than you could ever imagine. It says that while he is there, he hears Paul speaking. And it says this, that this man who could not walk, who was lame from birth, that he heard Paul speaking and after observing him closely and seeing that he had faith to be healed, Paul was preaching, but Paul was also looking. Paul saw this man. Now this is amazing to me, church. Paul was preaching and this man, it does not tell us exactly what was going on with this man's outer appearance. But there had to be something so different about this man from the time the sermon started to the time the sermon ended that there had to be something based on this man's expressions of his body language, his facial expressions. There was something about his spirit that was different at that time. He didn't cry out, I want to walk. He didn't cry out, have mercy. He just simply listened to what Paul was preaching. And Paul looked at him and said, I can tell your spirit right now, Something is happening with you based on what God is doing. It wasn't because Paul was some great preacher and Paul got up there and had some fancy sermon. It's because the word was so powerful. Paul looked at this man who could not walk, who could not do for himself, and guess what happened? Paul saw the word of God was splitting the sin out of that man and the healing was about to take place. Why? Because God is graceful and merciful. And it says here, friends, it says that Paul saw all of this and saw the man man's faith to be healed. And verse 10, it says, Paul said in a loud voice, he doesn't want anyone to misunderstand what's about to happen. So Paul says it loud. Thank God for preachers that speak loud enough for people to hear that have to wear hearing aids. It says, Paul said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. Now, here's the thing. Paul had to take a leap of faith just like this man. 
Now, now see, you're not going to hear a lot of preachers talk about that part. And why do I say that? I say that to you this morning for this reason. This man who is there, lame, cannot do for himself, he had to do his part. Faith without works is dead, right? The man could have faith, what he was hearing, but unless he was willing to act on that faith, what was going to happen? Paul could have faith. I'm going to preach this message, and God's going to move. But what was the action part of Paul? The action part is this, telling the man to do something that no one had seen the man ever do. Folks, I have faith that every time the Word of God is preached and proclaimed earnestly and faithfully, I have faith in my heart that lives can be transformed. If I did not believe that, I'd need to be in the car business. I need to be in some other kind of business. I don't need to be in evangelistic business. Why? Because there's no reason to plant a seed if you don't expect a harvest. And I'll tell you, don't get discouraged, church, that because we've planted seeds of the sermons we've preached and sung about Jesus, that while we are not overflowing, understand that many harvests take time to grow. And there's many times, my friends, as we continue to plant these seeds, and I'm in it with you. I'm in it to plant these seeds and water the harvest. I'm in it with you. And as we're in it together, understand there's going to be times there's going to have to be some pruning. Because how many of you understand that you might wonder, well, wonder why that person doesn't come to church anymore? Well, maybe it's because when they hear the Word of God preached in such a way that they're like, whoa, wait a minute. I can't, I don't want, I want to leave church feeling good. Well, my friends, you do leave church feeling good because your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. You don't leave church feeling good that because you sin, you can continue to sin. My gracious, what kind of Mickey Mouse religion is that if you can just do whatever you want to do? Here it says this, it says that this man hears Paul say in a loud voice, Get up! I'd love to say to us at times, we that have been spiritually lame for the Lord, I'd love to say to us at times, get up. But sometimes I don't have enough faith to say that because I don't know what the result would be. How many of you are afraid to invite someone to church because you don't know what their response is going to be? Well, my friends, unless we speak it, unless we do it, we will never know what the response will be. If Paul would have just kept it all bottled up inside, this wouldn't have happened like it happened. Here it says that whenever he speaks in a loud voice, come on, it says he speaks in a loud voice, and it says Paul said this, stand up upright on your feet, and the man, we don't know his name, and it doesn't matter his name, you will meet this man in glory. It says that he jumped up, and he started to walk around. You know why? It's because faith is active. Faith is active. Max Lucado said, Faith is the belief that God will do what is right. Paul knew God would do what was right. And obviously this man who was lame, that we do not know his name, but one day you will meet him and know his name, that whenever you find and ask him, you'll say to him, what exactly was the sermon he was preaching? And you'll hear exactly what Paul was saying. Corey Ten Boone says, Let God's promises shine on your problems. I believe that's what this man did that was lame. The promise of grace, the promise of hope, it was all over this man. And that's why Paul saw it. He was bathed in something amazing. Have you ever been around someone you just could tell there was something different about them? Their spirit was close to God, that they wanted a move of God. Didn't mean they weren't human. Didn't mean they didn't like to joke and cut up. Didn't mean any of those things. It meant when it was time to go and plow the field and plant the seeds, you know that they were serious about God. How many people are serious about God this morning? Then it continues to say this, he jumps up and he walks around and then when the crowd saw that Paul, what he had done, it wasn't what Paul had done, it was what God done through Paul. But you're going to notice what the people, how they respond to it. It's just exactly how people will respond today. People do not change, friends. It says when the people saw this, it raised a voice saying uh, in the Laconian language, it says the gods, so this is the language Paul and Barnabas did not speak, and it says the gods have come down to us in the form of men. And they started to call Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because they were, he was the main speaker. They were recognizing the power of God, but they wanted to give the men the credit 
be careful about this because Satan... Folks, get, be careful, singers. God bless you with a voice. Be careful to give God the glory and not yourself. But how many of you know there's a lot of people that started out in the church? Whitney Houston, Elvis Presley, so many others, Britney Spears. And what happened is that they started taking the glory and they got on stage for themselves and not God. Come on, be careful. Be careful when God gives you ability that you don't say to yourself, Well, look at me. You better say, look at the Lord. There's nothing wrong with saying thank you for the compliment. But when you say that, always make sure that you're saying, but to God be the glory. It says this, and then the priest, it says of Zeus and those temples who was outside the town, they brought oxen and garland to the gates. Oh, they're about to have a sacrifice. They're about to have a party. Because what happened? They thought that they were entertaining the gods of Zeus and Hermes in their own presence. They didn't realize that what they were simply doing is that they were in presence of someone that was filled with the Holy Ghost. And it says this, it says that they do this, and, and it, it continues, it says, He with the crowds intended to offer sacrifice. Why? Because they wanted to honor Barnabas and Paul. It's nothing wrong with honoring someone, but there comes a line that we cross when we start worshiping that person rather than the Creator. I mean, there's some people right now that worship the image of the Pope. They think the Pope is the, the greatest religious leader there is. But I will tell you, the Pope is a heretic. If he does not confess that Jesus Christ is the only way, and if he misleads people thinking that Mary is a way to be prayed to, that, that is wrong. And no one wants to really just call it out, but let's call it out and just say this. It is only God. It is only Christ. It is only the Holy Spirit. All of these other people are the ones who can be used by Him, but never, never overlook God and start worshiping that person. Oh, There's people that would drive miles and miles and miles to go hear certain famous preachers whenever they could go locally to their own towns and just simply hear the Word of God preached faithfully. I don't need to have a famous preacher to tell me about Jesus. What I need to have is the famous Holy Spirit to move through that minister, regardless of who he is. And it says the apostle uh, Barnabas and Paul, they begin to tear their clothes. Why? Because this was the idea. Don't do this. It worried them so much, they started to rip their clothes. And it says that when they heard this and they rushed to the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? You see, Paul and Barnabas wanted to make sure that they knew, these men in the village, that they knew it was not them who did this. It was God. It was because of Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It says, we are men also with the same nature as you. Wow, that's powerful. They Stop praising us. Focus on the Lord. It says, and when it says, and we are proclaiming what good news to you that you should turn from these worthless things. Turn away from that bull you just brought to kill. Turn away from that garland you just brought. Turn away from these sacrifices. Turn to Jesus. But you know the difference in Paul and Barnabas at that day compared to ministers today? Ministers today, if they had opportunity to be in the spotlight, so many of them would compromise their own convictions simply to have a podium. My friends, we might not ever get any larger when it talks about all the things that some we see on network television and all these other things. But understand this, be faithful in the little things. Never compromise the faith just to get more people in your presence. Here it says this, it says that proclaiming the good news to you that you should turn from those worthless things and not just turn, but turn to the living God. It's not just enough to tell the world they're wrong. And we do that so much. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. We got to tell them what is right. When we're training our children, we're not training them saying, don't touch the stove because I said so, but you tell them, don't touch it because I don't want to see you get burned. I love you too much to see you get hurt. Don't cross the road without looking both. Make sure you look both ways. Why? Because I don't want to see you get hurt. It says that turn to the living God 
And then notice this, it says, Who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in it. Why is Paul and Barnabas using this as an example? Is because the people of that village worship nature. And so what were they doing? They were using the elements that they worshipped, the earth, the heavens, the sea, and everything around it. They worshipped those things. They said, why are you worshipping this when you can worship the creator of these things? In the past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own way. Although he did not leave himself without a witness since, he did what is good by giving you rain. Notice, he, he blesses them. Even though that they did not deserve it, he still blesses them with rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and satisfying your hearts with food and happiness. Notice, that even while they were in their sin nature, the Lord pours out his mercy and grace. And then it continues, it says, Even though they said these things, they barely stopped the crowds from sacrificing to them. Even though they preached the gospel, notice, they just barely did get them to stop. They barely got them to stop, but they still stopped. They barely did it, but they still did it. I remember years ago watching, and it was talking about the Olympic runner that just it came in last place and the person asked them, they said, well, why didn't you give up when you realized that you were last? He said, I didn't train all this time. I didn't work all this way. I did not persevere. I did not get to this race for this Olympic race for this because I didn't come in first for me just to stop. You see, what happens a lot of times in church is that when we don't see something happen immediately, we want to just give up. Folks, it might take time. You know, this past week we put up a, a banner outside of church letting folks know that we are registering for pre-K here at our church. And when I put that banner up, the day afterwards I received a phone call from a lady who passes by our church. She said, every day, and she said, can I stop in and just see the program? I said, yes, you can. You don't give up. You continue to work and plow and plant. And then verse uh, 19, it says, and then some of the Jews came from Antioch. Now, I went and looked this up. They traveled, these Jewish people traveled almost 100 miles to come find Barnabas and Paul. Now, why do I tell you that? Because the last time that these men heard Barnabas and Paul preach, what did they want to do? They wanted to just kill them. I'm almost done, folks. And notice they traveled this far. Why? Because they're not done with their mission. How many of you know that the world... The devil will not give up. He will continue. If one temptation doesn't get you, if one trial doesn't get you, he might say, well, this didn't work. I'm going to try this. He'll do that. He'll do it to a church. He'll attack a church so many times. If this doesn't get them, I'll do this. If this doesn't get them, why? Because we've got to constantly be on our guard. And it says that they traveled. These Jews come from Antioch and Iconium. And it says, and when they had won over the crowd... They did something. And let me pause for a moment. One minute you have a crowd of people wanting to sacrifice, they want to, to give uh, money, they want to praise, they were, they were going to lift up Paul. I mean, if, if they could have, they'd have been like throwing him in the air. Hip, hip, hooray for Paul. And within a matter of moments, the same crowd who praised Paul is ready to persecute Paul. The same crowd who worshipped Paul was ready to bring wrath to Paul. Are you following me? Does that not remind you of the people when Jesus rode in on Palm Sunday? Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In Hebrew it would have been Baruch HaBab B'Shen Adonai. That's what they were saying. And then just a little bit later, what did that same crowd do? Crucify him. People are not any different today. Don't be trying to win the praises of the world because I will tell you this, my friends, the world who loves you today will crucify you tomorrow. Be true to Christ. Let's continue. It says that this crowd, it says they, they stir them up and it says that they begin because this other group won them over and they stoned Paul. They finally got it done. The message is going to stop. Oh, no. How many of you know there's an old song, there ain't no grave going to hold this body down? I'm going to tell you something. There's no stone can stop Paul unless it's the stone that Christ allows. 
And two, listen, and two, the Lord is done with you, saints. You will continue to do His work and His will. But when the Lord is done, then the Lord's done. But there is no one can who stop the gospel until the Lord is done with that vessel. Now notice how I know this. It says, because they stoned Paul, and it says they dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. Do you think these men just didn't understand the difference in life and death? Absolutely, positively, no. They did understand the difference. Do you not know when somebody's alive and dead? I sure hope so. Look at the person beside of you. Ask them, are you alive? The point I'm getting at is they thought he was dead because possibly was he dead? Regardless, you're right, it could have been. But regardless of the state, he had been stoned to the point that they believed he was dead. And they drag him out of the city. Why? Because you know, remember what? That's custom. <laughs> Let's don't break the law. In breaking the law, it says, And after the disciples, oh, I love this. I'm almost done, church. After the disciples surrounded him. How many of you, <laughs> how many of you, when you, <laughs> feel like you're at defeated, you need some people to get around you. Don't, don't overlook that text. After the believers of Jesus got around Paul, Paul does something. Mm. He starts opening his eyes. He looks around. Paul? Paul's alive. He should have been dead. But who wasn't done with him? The Lord. Let's continue. It says this. It says that Paul was dragged down. He had been stoned. They thought he was dead. And after the disciples surrounded him, that's, I'd mark that in my Bibles if I were you, because some, you need to be praying. God will put people around you whenever everyone thinks that you are down and out. When everyone thinks, oh, that's a sermon there in itself. When everyone thinks that you are dead, everyone thinks that you have no power. When everyone has counted you out, you better have a circle of friends, a circle of believers who are willing to get around you whenever you have nothing to offer them. But because they love you and they love the Lord, they're going to get around you and lift you up. Jesus, thank you for people to have gotten around me whenever I was down and out. Aren't you thankful for that as well? It says, after the disciples surrounded Paul, Paul got up and he went into the town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. Now, I'll stop there for a moment. What do we have? They thought he was dead. They stoned him. They drug him out. People got around him. He got back up. And what did he do? He went right back to the town they tried to kill him in. Oh, thank the Lord. Verse 21, we're almost done, church. It says, after they had evangelized that town, Paul said, you know what, I'm not done. Because there was a stone that was removed that my Savior came out of a tomb. So I'm not going to allow a stone to keep me down. It says that here it says they evangelized that town and they made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch. And strengthening the disciples by what? Encouraging them. That's a circle, your Bible verse. Circle, encourage them. Why? Because you need to encourage someone. Encouraging them to continue in the faith. The same faith that got a man that was lame, that Paul spoke to him and he got up and walked because of that faith that he had. He continues to say, your faith. And it says this, it says, Continue the faith and telling them this, this is the last verse. It is necessary to pass through many troubles on our way into the kingdom of God. He, Paul preached and said, we're going to have a lot of problems and troubles and tribulations. This is necessary. But never forget, until he's done, he's not done. Uh, did that make sense? Until he's done, he's not done. I love it. He's still working on me. He was still working on Paul. Later on, Paul's going to be bitten by a snake. Paul will be shipwrecked. Paul will go through beatings. Paul will go through imprisonment. But Paul also went through this stoning. Can I stop for a moment before we give an invitation and say this to you? Could it be Could it be that when Paul was facing this stoning, What went through Paul's mind? 
because it went through mine while I've read this text. And I'll tell you, please go back and this week reread what we just read. It will bless you more than you'll ever know. Could it have been that while Paul was being stoned, being murdered, he remembered that day not too long ago that he stood there and held the coats. He held the coats of men who stoned a man who said he loved Jesus. Now Paul was in that man's shoes. He's in Stephen's shoes. Could have been that he remembered what had happened that he took part in. And maybe in Paul's heart, Paul thought to himself, Lord, I'm not worthy of this. You see, friends, there will be many times stuff will happen to you as a believer in Jesus Christ that you'll look back and you'll think to yourself, oh, it's the grace of God that I'm saved. You see, God could have gave up on Saul of Tarsus. He could have gave up on this Apostle Paul, but God didn't. I believe that God allows everything to happen for a reason. I believe God even allows the evil that happens in this world to, for us to see and realize the grace and goodness of God. I do believe that. I do believe also that God allowed Paul to stand there and watch the first deacon chair of the church be murdered, be stoned to death. He allowed that to happen because now you understand, my friends, that Paul stands there being stoned and realizes that he took part in the very sin that he was forgiven of. Folks, Paul preached grace because why much grace had been given to him. He preached grace. Damn. Today as we get ready to leave this place, I'm going to ask you a question. Are there people in our community, are there people in our world, people in our television that we watch and we think to ourselves, oh, how degenerate these people are? We all have. We all believe that we're better than someone else. But let me just say this to you plainly. The same grace and the same mercy and the same God that saved you can save that person. I thank God for that, don't you? I thank God that He has not abandoned us whenever we deserved it. I thank God that while we were yet sinners, the Bible tells us Jesus died for us you and to me. He died for us. He didn't die because we were worthy to be to go to the cross for. He went and died whenever we were worthless. But He still loved us. Today, I challenge you this with this invitation. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. The invitation today, and regardless if you're watching by Facebook or regardless if you're letter, letter on listening to this on YouTube or you're in the fellowship hall this morning or you're right here in this sanctuary. We don't know who all will hear this message. It's amazing when I get emails and messages from other parts of the world, Germany and other places where people say, hey, watch your message and it really meant something. I don't take glory in that. I give God the glory. But here's the, here's the challenge. One, does your life need to be redeemed? Do you need to be saved? Do you need to turn to Jesus and ask Him for forgiveness of your sins? He can and will forgive you. Number two, do you need to rededicate and get back on fire for the Lord? Maybe you have been persecuted. Maybe you've been discouraged. Maybe you just don't have what you used to have in the fire that burned inside of your bones. The Lord can change all of that. Third, possibly today, do you need a circle of people to pray for you? I believe that there is power in prayer. I believe there's power in encouragement. You might say, I'd love to have that, Pastor. Well, can I tell you something, friends? Are you yourself willing to be that for someone else? Are you willing to send someone a text message out of the blue saying, praying for you just because I love you? Encouragement goes a long way. And finally, regardless of what persecution comes your way, will you continue to say, because of Jesus, I am saved. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We ask that your spirit move right now in this invitation. The most important part of our worship service is the invitation.
Because at the end of the day, we'll be like the people of that city. It says the people were divided. Listen, church, the people were divided. Those who sided with the gospel message and those who sided with the message of the world. It cannot be any more clear. You either leave this place today leaving with Jesus or you leave here today rejecting Him. Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, give your burden to the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.